Good afternoon. I have come to talk about racism. I've also come to be helpful. 34 days ago, white nationalists marched onto the University of Virginia campus. They went there to protect white supremacy. They went there to chant racist, anti-Semitic, and homophobic words of hate. Raise your hands in this audience if you were horrified and disgusted by the racism that was on display at UVA 34 days ago. By my estimation, at least 7,000 of your hands were raised. I went to Charlottesville seven days after the racial crisis there to speak to all the UVA faculty and staff. I instructed them to do the exact same thing that I just asked of you. I asked them to raise their hands if they were horrified and disgusted by the racism that was displayed on their campus the previous week. As is the case here this afternoon, nearly every hand in that auditorium was raised. I then said to them what I am going to say to you. We cannot be selectively horrified and disgusted by racism. We must be horrified and disgusted by all of its manifestations, including those that happen in the college admission process. Therefore, I've titled this address for this afternoon, This Too is Racism. We must be concerned, those of us who are so deeply committed to expanding opportunity for all young Americans from all racial groups, those of us who are the gatekeepers at times or the key holders, we must understand that racism isn't just tiki torch carrying white nationalists. It's not just the things that Donald Trump says. It's also the things that happen in high schools and in college admission offices. So what I will do here in my attempt to be helpful, right now my assignment is to be helpful to you, but I have to be honest with you, my mission is to use this platform right now to be most helpful to millions of Americans, particularly college students and high school students of color and their families. I must use this platform to be helpful to them by raising your consciousness about some things that you perhaps inadvertently and unknowingly do that also sustains and exacerbates racism. The first is valuing black lives differently in college counseling relationships. As Nancy mentioned, I've spent now 15 years studying black male success in high schools and higher education. One of my most significant projects was my National Black Male College Achievement Study that took me to 44 colleges and universities in 20 different states around the country. As you can see here, there were a range of institution types, and that this work took me to a range of geographic regions around our nation. In this study, I was primarily concerned with how young black undergraduate men successfully navigated their ways to and through higher education. These were achievers. These were successful young men. In the portion of the interviews with these 219 young men with whom I spent two to three hours doing face-to-face -face individual interviews on these campuses, at one juncture in the interviews, we were talking about their college selection process, their college search and choice process. So they walked me through the whole process. I wanted to know how they got to these places. Then at the end, I asked, tell me about the role your high school counselor played in your college search process. 
almost like clockwork. Whenever I asked that question, the guy would fall back in his seat, he'd sort of take a deep breath, and he'd make a face, and he would say various things like, he didn't really have a role. I was left on my own. I'm here despite what she told me. There was no real serious investment in my pathway to college by my counselor. You know, perhaps this is best illustrated in the example of Sam. So Sam said to me, my guidance counselor, she was a great person, but not really involved in anything at all. This is what happened. I asked her to write a recommendation for me. She wrote the crappiest recommendation. You couldn't even tell that it was for me. So as a sidebar asked, what do you mean by that? He said, you know, it was just so generic, it really could have been for anyone. I took it back to her and I said, no. I gave you a list of four pages of information that shows you in detail what I've accomplished in high school. Sam exercised tremendous agency by saying to his high school counselor, no, your generic recommendation letter is unacceptable to me. I am too accomplished for you to send this anywhere in support of my applications. This was really juicy for me, so I, I asked Sam, okay, so then what? <laughs> Sam talked to me about the next steps. You know, he thought that uh, perhaps the, she had given the letter back to him, by the way, the counselor, and it wasn't much better. So Sam surmised that perhaps the four pages of his achievements in high school was too much for her, that it was overwhelming. So he reduced his achievement summary to two pages instead of four. Then he gave it back to the counselor. Sam reports that she then sprinkled in a few things into that weak letter that she had written. Sprinkled. Not substantively, meaningfully engaging and unpacking how wonderful this young man is, the tremendous leadership that he displayed at his school. He said instead that she sprinkled a few of the little facts from his two-page achievement summary. Then what, Sam? So Sam was frustrated. So he took her letter, he retyped portions of it, and he inserted other portions in his own words. Sam is 17. He takes his counselor's letter and retypes it. Okay, then what? She signed the letter, sent it to places in support of Sam's college admissions applications. I'm pretty sure that Sam would want me to tell this story to you because this happens time and time and time again. I'm so afraid. Now, you may wonder, well, then what happened with Sam? Yeah, he got into Stanford, and he graduated in four years with a 3.8 GPA. I cannot be convinced otherwise that there is no way that Sam would have gotten admitted to Stanford with that recommendation letter that his counselor first wrote for him and then revised and it still was no good. Imagine how different Sam's life would have been had he not gotten into Stanford or to a place like it. He deserved to be there, clearly. But yet his life was valued differently in the college admission process. Now I know some of you may wonder and say to yourselves skeptically, skeptically, uh, yeah, some of you may be skeptics. How about that, that's a little easier and say, well, uh, this doesn't sound like it's about race. It sounds like it's just about a bad counselor who was being negligent. The problem is, Sam and others, over and over and over again, said to me, but they don't treat the white kids that way. They write them glowing recommendations. I've seen them. They spend a lot of time with the white kids in their offices. They spend a lot of time with white families. They know the white kids. White kids don't have to give them a four-page or two-page sort of cheat sheet. But for us, 
they value our lives and our futures differently. That too is racism. Understand, or undermatching rather, undermatching is a form of structural racism. Maintaining that kids from here don't get into schools like those, therefore we ought not try, is a way in which high school counselors participate in the structural racism that is undermatching. Another young man from the study, his name is Mike. He said she laughed when I told her where I wanted to apply. I said, you mean she actually laughed? Mike says, yes, she literally laughed in my face. She told me I had no chance of getting into the University of Michigan or Harvard, that Central Michigan and Western Michigan were more likely. She insisted that Michigan, the University of, would be a far reach. I usually don't editorialize in interviews. I just actively listen and ask, you know, important probing questions. But I said, wow, damn, that's unbelievable. It's absurd. Mike says, correct. I think so too. What's so unbelievable and absurd about what Mike's college counselor, high school counselor said to him? about what were his likely options or a far reach. What's absurd about it is that I interviewed Mike here in Boston across the bridge over in Cambridge. He was a student at Harvard. That too is racism. To misdirect a young man with a promising future who is extraordinarily gifted like Mike and no, listen, no offense, I, I, I went to a school like Central Michigan, Western Michigan. I'm not being elitist here. What I am saying, though, is that that would have been a ridiculous undermatch for Mike, and it's therefore racist. Yeah, it's also not the first and the only time that I've heard these kinds of things or seen undermatching play itself out in really painful and horrifying ways. Another time was in New York City. Three years ago, four years ago now, a team of researchers and I from the University of Pennsylvania spent five months traveling back and forth from Philadelphia to New York City. We were there doing interviews with black and Latino male college juniors and seniors who were college bound, college ready, definitely going to college. We wanted to understand what were the forces and the factors that were leading these young men to college because so much of the conversation in our nation is so deficit focused. Why are there so few? Why do so few go on to college? Why are they so tragically underprepared for success in college when they get there? We were more interested in these black and Latino male juniors and seniors who had succeeded, who were thriving. We wanted to understand what were the personal, institutional, familial, communal, and other kinds of factors that had led to their college readiness. In our interviews, before they started, we gave each student a profile form. On the back side of the profile form, for the seniors, we asked, please list all of the colleges and universities to which you have applied. For the juniors, we asked, please list all of the colleges and universities to which you expect to apply next year. These interviews happened in the spring, so therefore the seniors really had already applied and most of them had you know, already gotten multiple offers of admission. Be mindful that these are the best and brightest black and Latino male students in these schools. One thing that was horrifying for me, I didn't just send my research team, my graduate students, in to do the interviews. I did some, many of them myself. I would sit across from these young men of color who were so gifted. Their brilliance was mind-blowing. I wasn't surprised by it. I expected them to be gifted and, and, and really smart, but still mind-blowing. 
Then I would turn the sheet over for the seniors and see that the overwhelming majority of them had only applied to CUNYs and perhaps an occasional SUNY. Again, I'm not a school snob. I have tremendous respect for the City University of New York. My problem here is that many of these young men absolutely had a shot at the place at which I spent a decade as a faculty member, Penn. Many of them had a shot at the place where Mike was, Harvard, or where Sam was, Stanford. I will never forget that I actually ended up in an argument. I don't get into arguments with my research participants. But I ended up getting into an argument with this young man um, who was a junior. So for him, it wasn't too late. So, you know, I, I looked at his sheet and I saw where he was planning, where he was planning to apply. And I said to him, you know, these are, these are fine schools. These are good schools. But you do know that with this academic profile and with your brilliance, you really could get into a place like Penn. And he said to me, no, I can't. And I said to him, yes, you can. And he said, nope. And I said, dude, I work there. I'm a professor there. What are you saying? Like, yes, I'm telling you, you could get into Penn with this. And he said, no, I can't. Then he also said to me, and if I got in, there's no way that I'd be able to afford it. I'm like, dude, um, I'm looking back at his profile because I don't want to make assumptions about his socioeconomic status, but we had a set of questions in it in the profile form where we asked about SES, and I was like, yeah, dude, like, uh, y y you could go to Penn at no cost. It's not his fault that he didn't know that. He very likely would have accumulated tons of debt, as a matter of fact, going to a public university that may not have been able to offer him as much aid and support. He could have gone to Penn for free. I'll tell you one last story. It's not really a story. It's just a, a thing that we notice time and time again. When we were in these high schools, it was very clear to us that the counselors were deeply committed to getting every student into some place. They were on skates. They were running around, managing lots. But I finished an interview with a young man who told me that he wanted to apply to the University of Virginia and that his counselor told him that kids from here don't get into UVA. So therefore, he didn't apply. I was very upset about this. Because again, here's this brilliant young man. So afterwards, I mean, I hope I was like, I don't know, like polite about it and, you know, not really a jerk. But like I went to the counselor and I asked her, why did you tell this guy that he couldn't get into UVA, that kids from here don't get into places like that? And she said, because they don't. And I said to her, what do you mean? And she said, well, you know, a few years ago, and I said, few, how many? She was like, you know, like three or four years ago, there were two students from here who applied to UVA and they didn't get in. And I just, I have so much to manage that, you know, I can't spend my time trying to get students into, you know, a school like UVA if they don't stand a shot. And I said to her, but have you ever like actually talked to this guy that I just talked to for two hours? Furthermore, is the UVA admissions process the exact same every year? I mean, I, I, I need not tell you that admissions sometimes could be a bit subjective, right? It could be a bit sort of left up to the people who are, who are reviewing that particular applicant. Like, I just think that it's really racist to say to a person that kids from here don't get into places like that, sorry. Uh, let me introduce you to this guy, Brenton. Brenton was one of the juniors in our study in New York City. Again, these were traditional urban public high schools. They were 94% black and Latino on average. More than two thirds of the students at these 40 schools across New York City uh, more than two-thirds of them were eligible for free lunch, and just about all the others were eligible for reduced lunch. These were high-poverty schools in high-poverty neighborhoods. 
Brenton went to one of them. He was a junior. We had a shot with Brenton. It wasn't too late for him. So with the juniors, we intervened. We took their profile forms back to Penn, and we said, listen, we're going to make sure that these guys know that there is an, a, a wide array of institutional post-secondary options for them beyond the ones that are simply in their neighborhoods that they only know about because they're the only ones that their counselors are introducing them to. Brenton was the first student in his high school to be admitted to an Ivy League university. He is now a senior at the University of Pennsylvania. I made absolutely certain that Brenton knew about Penn, that he got into Penn, and that he would not be the last from his school to get into Penn. In fact, the following year, James Fisher came from Brenton's high school to University of Pennsylvania, where he is now a junior. Undermatching is racist. So too is telling high achieving black students that historically black colleges and universities are no good. In the interviews for the National Black Male College Achievement Study, the one that I showed you earlier with the 44 colleges and universities, uh, you may have noticed that 30 of those were predominantly white universities, 14 were historically black colleges and universities. So when we got to the part with the, you know, tell me about the role that your high school counselor played in your college search and choice process. Many of these young men who were at Morehouse and at Howard and at Tuskegee and at Fisk said, yeah, my counselor told me I was too good to come here. Now, I realize that that may feel like a little bit of a contradiction to the undermatch conversation that I just had with you. The problem here is that counselors didn't say to them that yeah, it's only because of your academic brilliance that, you know, you deserve to be, say, at, at Princeton. But no, it was that, yeah, North Carolina Central, that's not a good school. How do you know? Have you ever been there? The young men said to us, said to me, it was just me, I didn't have a posse at that time, said to me that it felt like the counselors were suggesting to them and I need not remind you of the demographics of the counseling, the high school uh, college counseling profession is mostly white, so these were mostly white counselors, and to be sure I asked them to always talk with me about the race of the counselor in this particular segment of the interview, but it felt to them like the counselor was suggesting that just because it's black, it cannot possibly be good. Need I remind you that historically black colleges and universities enroll roughly 11-ish percent of black undergraduates in U.S. higher education, but yet they graduate about a fifth of black graduate uh, bachelor's degree holders, but yet they produce more than 56 percent of blacks who go on to pursue doctorates in all fields. That sounds good to me. I don't know, maybe I'm soapboxing because I went to a historically black university as an undergraduate student, and I think that it's absurd and perhaps even racist to suggest that nothing good could possibly come out of there or nothing good can be happening there. Saying we can't find enough college-ready, highly qualified black male applicants. Given my work on black male success, as you might imagine, lots of college presidents and deans and provosts, you know, reach out to me for advice on diversifying their student bodies writ large. And then as a part of that conversation, they say, yeah, we have a particular challenge finding highly qualified, admissible black male students who meet our rigorous admission standards. We just can't find them. We just, they just don't really exist. Yeah, but you can find them when you want them to play on the football team and the men's basketball team at schools like these in the Power Five conferences. You can find them easily when you want them to earn millions of dollars for your university. You will, not, you will go to the depths of the earth to find them. You will not only drive across town or uh, in another part of the state. If you live in Texas, you will fly to Wyoming. You will fly to Pennsylvania to get this guy. Why is it that college admissions professionals are so unwilling to do the same thing. Uh, why, why, why do we maintain that we can't find them and that they don't meet our standard? I mean, if they don't meet our standard, perhaps they shouldn't be admitted to play 
to run the ball on our fields and courts. We certainly could find them when it's in our self-interest, our economic interest as institutions to find them. That is a serious form of institutional racism. Yeah, on a related note, I keep finding these black students and other students of color, like I go around to campuses and I'm mostly talking to administrators and faculty members, but almost always, I'll, as a part of my visit, I'll spend some time with students of color, you know, just sort of having, getting a sense of their experiences, the racial climate, and so on. So I'm in these, in these sometimes just hanging out sessions with, with black students and we go around the room and I ask them to tell me, where are you from and what high school did you go to? It becomes like a like a song, like a like a like a repetitive song. I was at a school in Illinois recently. I'm from Chicago. I went to this high school. I'm from Chicago. I went to the same high school as him. I'm from Chicago. I went to the same high school as her. So after a while, I'm like, wait, all these kids are from, all of them are from Chicago? And they all went to like these same two or three schools? Yeah, it's a phenomenon, it's a national phenomenon, as a matter of fact, where we go everywhere to find football players and to find international students. We'll go to China to find them, or you know, we'll go everywhere to find white students. You know, a point of pride for many universities is that we have students from all 50 states and from a certain number of countries and so on and so forth, but yet all the black students seem to come from two cities and only a small handful of high schools in those cities. Is that not also racist? It feels that way to me. They're brilliant black people all over the country, every state, every city. But yet, we're most invested in doing what's convenient, going to the same place over and over, getting the same few students. Well, no wonder you can't find any highly qualified black students who meet your admission standards. Well, if you keep going to the exact same place looking for them, then perhaps you're gonna find what you've always found. All right, so, listen, uh, uh, benchmarking can be good. It can let us know how we're doing vis-a-vis -vis our peers. We can also learn things from our peer institutions and so on. I think it is a strange coincidence, very strange, that when you look across the eight Ivies plus Stanford and MIT, Yo, like there's the exact same percentage of black students at all of them, with the exception of Princeton, which has, you know, one percentage point more. Like it seems to me like a group of well-intended white admissions professionals in the Ivies got together and said, this is going to be our number. I, you know, it's just too much of a coincidence. You mean to tell me that the exact same number of black folks applied to Dartmouth and to Stanford, and to MIT, and to Yale, and to Princeton, and they all landed at the, at the same place in terms of their enrollments. It just seems to me that there has been some determination about how many folks, how many students of color, how many black students are worthy of admission to this institution. It just, I, I can't, I, I don't know, it's just too, it's just too similar, it's just, it's identical. I mean, you see these numbers, they're from the US Department of Education, I didn't make them up, they're like official federal data. <sighs> yeah, so there is, um, could we talk a moment about curricular racism? There are programs, graduate programs, degree programs, that prepare counselors for the high school counseling profession. There are also programs that prepare administrators in the post-secondary context. I've spent my entire career teaching in those kinds of programs. My colleagues tell me over and over and over again that we didn't really talk about race and racism and how to do racial equity in our graduate programs, in our counselor ed programs, in our higher ed programs. So it's no wonder that folks go into the college counseling profession and into the college admission profession without knowing how to do racial equity. It's no wonder that people enter into the college admission 
review process with all sorts of implicit biases that were never awakened, that were never challenged, that were never confronted. There was nothing that happened in the curriculum, in the programs that prepared them to be race conscious, to be racial problem solvers, and to value black lives and Latino lives and Native American and Asian American lives in equitable ways. So in some ways, it's not their fault that all of this racism that I'm talking about in its myriad manifestations occurs over and over and over again because we never taught these would-be professionals how to do racial equity, how to talk and think about racism, and how to equitably serve students and families and communities of color. You may have noticed, maybe not, depending on your lens, that there's quite a bit of stratification in the profession. This too is racist. This too is racism. What do I mean? by stratification, when we look at the college admission profession, the folks who are at the top, vice presidents, deans, directors, they're white. The people who are at the lower levels of the organization, low paid entry level professionals who don't have a lot of power and authority, they're people of color, stratification. Tremendous stratification. My student, D'Angela Burns Wallace, who is now vice provost for undergraduate studies at the University of Kansas, uh, spent much of her career as an admissions dean at Stanford University. Uh, D'Angela was my first doctoral student at Penn, and she did her dissertation on the experiences of what she called senior admission diversity officers. So basically, like the one Latina in the admissions office who was responsible for like all things uh, related to diversity, she studied her, those people, right? About this stratification, one participant in Dr. Burns Wallace's research said, you can't bring someone at a very junior level and say it's your responsibility to coordinate multicultural admissions. Because then what you're saying is, here's a person at the lowest rung of the office who's doing this work and telling the person three levels above them what to do. You can't do that. It doesn't work that way. That person has no power. I've talked enough about my own research. Let me keep talking about Dr. Burns Wallace's uh, for a moment. Another horrifying theme in her research was the ways in which these admissions officers, these people of color who were in her study, doing the best that they could to try to raise the consciousness of their white colleagues about the need to live out the, and, and, and enact the values and the mission that the institution was espousing. They were doing this oftentimes on their own. They were the only person of color in almost all of these instances. All of their colleagues were white. They told story after story after story about how their colleagues would completely dismiss their advocacy for particular communities of color. How their colleagues would say in admissions brochures that we really care about diversity and about equity and we want to diversify this campus and we want to put in the picture of the multicultural students sitting on the lawn where you got like the Chinese kid, you got the black kid, the Latino, white kids, right? You, you, you got them, we want to put that in there, but we don't really want to do anything to get more of these students here. Everything that you try to do, we're going to push back. We're going to disrespect you. And you're at the lowest level of the organization, so you better watch out because the person who had this job before you, you saw what happened to that person, right? So you, yeah, so these admissions professionals were extremely frustrated. They were disrespected by their white colleagues. That is racist. That is racism. You can't say that you value diversity, but have only one person in the admissions office, on the admissions team, who really values diversity, and you push back on everything that that person tries to advance to help the mission of the institution. I'm afraid that I am unconvinced that an association as large as yours, comprised of people, professionals, 
who are as powerful as you are. People really look up to you. They value your opinion and what you have to say. I'm unconvinced that this association and its members cannot leverage its collective voice and its collective impact to do something about the ridiculous, disproportionate imbalance in counselor to student ratios in public high schools that serve primarily black and brown kids in low income communities. Your profession is 80% white. It's even whiter when we get to those who are at the top levels. It sure would be nice if a mostly white professional association and its members more powerfully, more responsibly, and more loudly advocated for racial justice on behalf of those who don't have the resources that they deserve in high schools across our nation. Racism isn't just this. This is bad. What happened 34 days ago at UVA is bad. It's really bad. Lives were lost because of this racism. I'm going to take a leap here and say that the racism that I just laid out for you in this myriad manifestations perhaps is worse than this. Surely, lives were lost here. So many other lives, though, are ruined when they are misdirected in the college guidance and admission and counseling process. So many other lives are damaged when they are locked out of opportunities for which they worked so hard and for which they are so deserving. So many other lives are lost and, 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 are, are, and are negatively affected by counselors who say to kids that you are not smart enough to be at our nation's leading institutions. That is also racism that happens every day in school after school after school across our country. This isn't just a one-time occurrence on a bad night in Charlottesville. This is something that happens every day in high schools and on college campuses around the country. That, too, is racist. Please, do better. I hope this was helpful, and I am just honored that I had an opportunity to be helpful to the millions of people, mostly young black and brown people, for whom I had this opportunity to talk with you about.